morning. And um, that is my prayer. That being said, I'm not a preacher. I normally teach, but I am going to try to unpack God's Word this morning and see what He might speak to us about Himself and about the wonderful gift of music that we all have the opportunity to share in. So this week, your church is celebrating Church Music Week. Um, just the fact that your congregation emphasizes this makes this music professor very joyful. I wish more churches would do this, um, but it's just been a wonderful time. I've, I've, been do, I've been talking with Ian, been doing a little research of my own, just trying to get a feel for the congregation I was going to share with, and it is, it is evident that your church values music. And it's evident that your church values the gifts of your congregation, musical and otherwise. The fact that you have such an expansive ministry to different groups of people and in this community is a testimony to your faithfulness to Christ. But as I was doing my research, I discovered that your church and music ministry has a well-crafted mission statement. Now, it's on your website. I hope it's still up to date. It's fantastic regardless. But I'd like to share that with you if you haven't heard this before. It says, we use and discipline God-given musical gifts in the glory of His name, attributes, and deeds, the formation of our expression and taste on how we worship Him and one another, and witness with His goodness, greatness, and beauty. That's fantastic. I'm going to take that and use it. I will quote you and I will reference your congregation. But that is a wonderful expression. Um, and I just want to unpack that for just a moment. I could, that could be the text of our sermon today, but it's not the Word of God. But I do want to bring a few things out to you that, um, that you celebrate as a congregation. First, I love the intention to use and discipline the God-given gift of music. As a church body, we are called to be stewards of the good gifts that God has given the church, and that includes music. We're called to cultivate these gifts with care. Now, I am no farmer. I do not have a green thumb, as they have say. When I plant things, they die, okay? But I have family, and my grandparents had farms, and I would watch my grandfather carefully cultivate the ground and plant the seed and water them, and then with patience, wait for the crops to spring up. Um, maybe as an eight-year-old boy, I didn't have the patience. Maybe that was my problem. But with music, and as any gift, it takes a cultivation, a discipline. For some of us who have music as a profession, that meant hours of time spent in the practice room. For others, it might mean the discipline of coming to a choir rehearsal or an instrumental rehearsal or band rehearsal or whatnot. But it is a discipline that is used then to glorify God. When I think about this concept, I think about a passage from um, the Old Testament where David was, was um, in his pride, called for a census against what the Lord had commanded him to do. And the Lord sent a pestilence on his land, and David, in repentance, went to a threshing floor and, and intended to offer a sacrifice. And um, let me read these words of Scripture to you. Then Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king, this is David, said to Aruna, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. That is a powerful word to us, whether it's in music or whatever gift you have that we have a responsibility to cultivate that and to discipline that gift for the glory of God. We don't bring God our, our, our leftovers of worship, the things that we don't care about. We bring to God our best, and we bring to God that which is precious to us, for He is wor he's worthy of that. So the disciplining of music is a wonderful pursuit. Secondly, your statement says that these gifts are used to glorify God according to His attributes and actions. We're going to talk about that this morning, but I wholeheartedly concur. And then lastly, the use of the God-given gift of music helps shape our ideas of beauty, preference, and expression of adoration and praise and worship of Him. The reality is we all come to church this morning with our experiences, our backgrounds, the music that we like, 
the things, the, the way that we like to dress, how much coffee you had this morning before you came here, how much sleep you had last night. We all come as a body of Christ with various experiences, and we are called together to put those aside. I love what, what you shared with this, this morning, that we're called to not come as individuals, but come as the body of Christ to offer worship to our God. And that is what we do every time we gather. So again, that's a wonderful statement. Pastor Ian, good job. That was you. Um, but thank you, church, for doing that. Um, so let's now turn to our text. We, we've read it this morning. I, um, this is honestly one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. So when I, was, when, when I got the invitation to come, I was prayerfully seeking what God might want for me to share with you, and my mind and heart kept coming back to this verse. So we're going to take a look at Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, starting in verse 12, as we've read. I'm going to read it again. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's a music word there, just, just a bit of record there. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So this wonderful passage comes in the midst of Paul's letter to the Colossians. And in this letter, he unpacks some amazing truths about who Christ is. In chapter 1, he speaks about the preeminence of Christ, who is above all and in all, and all things point to him. And then he speaks to them of the gospel that he's proclaiming to them. And he commends them and says, this is the word that I have received from the Lord that I'm telling to you. And then he warns those Colossians of those who might come in from the outside or emerge from the inside and telling them to put aside the, the freedom that they've received in Christ and take up a yoke of bondage. And he's warning them to not go beyond the gospel. And after giving them a list of these behaviors to put aside, we didn't read that. That would be in verse 10 and 11. Paul goes on and tells them to put on these behaviors as if you would put on an article of clothing. Put on kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. He tells them that they are to be a community of faith marked by different ethical behaviors, a different way of life, a way of life that's marked with love and forgiveness and deference to one another. He then turns and gives them an imperative. He says, do this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's an intentional action that we're called to So what is this word of Christ? Well, this is the essential message and truth of the gospel of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Earlier in the letter, Paul shares this description of the preeminence of Christ. Again, one of my favorite passages, this is in Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent." For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the message of the gospel. And as believers, we are called to let this truth dwell in us. What truth is this? The truth that Christ is the very image of the invisible God and shows us what the Father is like. We don't 
hold aside the message of who Jesus is. In a world today where, where people might want to um, put forth ideas of Jesus that aren't true, we wholeheartedly embrace what the Scriptures say about who Jesus is. We are not embarrassed of them. This is Paul's words. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not ashamed of the one we, are, we worship. We proudly say we are His and He is ours. We also proclaim that the truth that He is the Word by which all things were created. That just believing this concept puts us at odds with most of the world around us. We say that He is our Creator and we are the creature. And if that is true, then we are obligated to Him as His, cre- as his creature. As, as his creator. Cre- creature, I can't speak this morning. As His creature, excuse me. The world doesn't like this. If we're honest in our moments, we don't like that responsibility to God. But it's true, and this is one of the pieces of the gospel that we proclaim. We proclaim that He is above all things, and He is the unifying factor of all creation. The truth of the gospel is that He is the head of this church and every body that gathers together to worship Him. And it's through His redemptive work on the cross that we have received reconciliation with God and atonement for our sins. These truths are not to just be casual things that we agree with on Sunday and then go live our lives Monday through Saturday as if there's something we put on the shelf and then we pick them up when we come to church. These truths are to be anchors of our lives, things that inform our decisions, that shape the things we consume with media, the feelings and emotions that we have, these are guiding lanes as as in traffic lanes to guide our affections. But this passage doesn't say it's a casual thing. It says that the word of Christ is to dwell in us richly. The word Paul uses here is to, to describe this indwelling means it's a characterized by an identifiably distinct manner and by great material possessions. Now, Pastor Coe and I are professors at CBU, and we interact with college students on a daily basis. I hear stories from them, and I remember my own college dorm life. It was not dwelling richly, I can assure you of that fact. Um, we, it was not luxury. It was rather spartan. The mattress was probably about an inch and a half thick. When the sheets were made, they were, they were thin, and they were light, and it was, a, it was a thin pillow. It was not luxurious living. Now, I remember as I, as I got older, I got married, we have, my wife and I have four children, we, we would bring them to my father's house in Louisiana, and my, my dad had a lovely home. Um, it was beautifully manicured, um, just well-appointed, um, not luxurious, but very nice, and we would bring our children there. And it was not the right place for our children, right? It was like, don't touch this, and don't touch this, and sit right here, and don't move, and those kinds of things. That's the contrast. Paul says we are to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. Not the bare minimum, but an overabundance, an overflow of excess. So my first question to you this morning, and you you need to answer this within yourself, is the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly this morning? Or are you living on the lessons you've learned years ago? Do you just have a remembrance of the Word of God? Or is it fresh in your mind and your heart because of what you read this morning? That's a question I have to ask myself. As a seminary professor, as a minister of music, it's very easy to live off of yesterday's manna from heaven. Right? We are called to daily partake in the Word of God and to hide it deep within our hearts and to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. That word indwell means to take up permanent residence. I think about the Holy Spirit indwelling the believers. I think about the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Old Testament, the, the Spirit of God came to dwell within the tabernacle there in, in, among the people of Israel. We are called to let this word of Christ, the gospel, indwell our lives. Paul then goes on to describe how we're to do this. He states that we are to teach and admonish each other. Every congregation has members within it who are blessed with the ability to open up the word of God and to teach it. In our congregations, we have ministers and pastors who do this from the pulpit. 
We have ministers who do this in Sunday school classes and who open up the word to young children and to teach them and instruct them in the way of the Lord. But we're called to do two things here. We're called to teach the word of God. This means we're communicating information. I, so I, I spoke earlier, I have, I have four children, 12, 9, 7, and 5, all right? So pray for me, um, first of all. Um, but I love, I love my children. I love the sense of wonder when they're learning new things. And one of the things that I've had to learn as a parent, you forget what it's like to not know something. Like try to teach someone how to tie a pair of shoes. You haven't actually thought about how to do that in years. You just do it. And then when you're explaining something to someone who's never experienced before, you have to slow down. You have to think about the action and then explain it to them in a way that they can replicate it. It's the same with the Word of God. When we explain truths of the Scriptures, we have to take our time and unpack them. So we are called, and here the, the, word, the, the word that we read, it wasn't that the pastor should teach you and admonish you. Let the Word of Christ dwell within you all as you teach and admonish one another. So the second verb, he tells us, is to admonish each other. We don't really use this word in the English language that often. I don't think, I'm going to go admonish my children right now. That's not something I think about doing. But it means to give strong encouragement, to exhort each other, to not only get information, but to let that information transform the way that we live and transform the way that we think and behave in the world. So the first action is the communication of information, and the second action has to do with the application of this word. So you're probably thinking, I thought this was church music week. Where, where, where's the music? Well, we're getting there. So we, we arrive at the crux of this passage. It says, the passage continues to say, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. So I normally study and read from the English Standard Version. It's my preference, but I love the New American Standard, which we read from this morning. There are many other faithful translations of the Bible. And the reality is we're reading a document that's thousands of years old. And in the language that, that very few of us, perhaps Pastor Ko is the only one fluent in it in this congregation, but we, we make choices of how to interpret things. And I, I think that... In this case, the ESV doesn't necessarily capture the thrust of what's going on here. So Paul lists three verbs in a row. He says, teaching, admonishing, and singing. And so those who have given their lives to studying the God's Word um, are split on how these words relate to each other. Um, some translations imply that we teach and admonish each other as we sing to each other, or through the singing of the Word of God. I think that's what the New American Standard Version just said we read. So I believe that this is precisely what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, you as the gathered body of believers, teach and admonish each other as you make music to the Lord. Now this is in marked contrast with the way that you experience music every other moment of your life, okay? For most of us, music is something that lives in the background or the periphery of our lives. We put it on while we're getting ready in the morning, or we're listening to music in the car, or maybe while we're at the gym, but it's not something that's in the front of our mind. And most of us, most, of, most people who are not musical don't usually sing. We live in a culture that is not a singing culture in many ways. Um, I, I often tell my students, just imagine, where do people who are not Christian, who are not musical, sing in public on a, on a regular basis? And they sit there, and they, there's very few places we do it. We may sing the national anthem at the Dodgers game. We may sing happy birthday at a birthday party, which, by the way, as a parent of young children, the quality of happy birthday is on a steep decline. <laughs> <coughs> Um, I, I just like to now, just like to listen and see how many keys we go through in Happy Birthday. Um, but the average person doesn't sing, please don't answer out loud, but how often did you sing this week outside of church? And how often did you do it in public? Yet every Sunday your leaders say, will you stand and will you sing to the Lord? And you're like, D do you hear me? You really want me to do that? Paul tells us all that we are to do this not only because we enjoy music, music is a wonderful gift, and it's to be enjoyed, 
but it has a spiritual action. It is a vehicle for carrying and communicating the Word of God. And it enables you to teach and admonish yourself first, and then to teach and encourage each other as we gather with the body of Christ. So just so I'm clear, I don't want to, I don't want to give any misconception. The preaching of the, the singing of the Word of God is not the only way the Word of God is communicated. Each week, the preaching of the Word of God is a central action of what we do in worship. We should prioritize it. We should dedicate ourselves to it. But singing and making music is a wonderful way to do it. So when we, when we read this passage alongside its parallel passage in the book of Ephesians, this, this meaning comes even more clearly. So if you, would, if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, the, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, starting in verse 18, we see a, a, a very similar set of words with a slightly different emphasis. Paul says, this is starting in the second half of verse 18, "...but be filled with the Spirit." addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In Ephesians, Paul calls the believers to be filled with the Spirit as they sing. In Colossians, Paul calls them to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you sing. And if we want to zoom our theological lenses back a little further and put these together, we see songs of praise to the Father through the Word of Christ, empowered by the Spirit. And we see the Trinity at work as we gather together in worship. So we can comfortably say that the Scriptures teach us to teach each other the Word of God as we sing. So why music? What is so special about music? As we already already said, not everyone is musical. I do believe that everyone can make music. I am a firm believer of that. In my many years of doing this, there have been maybe on one hand of the people I've encountered that cannot be musical. Now I can give you hundreds of people who've told me they aren't musical, but that's not the same thing. I believe that music is a gift from God, and I believe it is part of how we have been created in His image, and it's a natural expression of that. So why music? What's so important about music that a church should dedicate time and resources and energy and building space and precious moments in a service each week to making music? Well, I'll give, I'll give you seven reasons why I believe that music is a powerful tool for letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. First of all, singing and making music gives us the ability to actively participate in worship. Okay? Now, again, it's an unusual thing for me to be up here speaking to a congregation. I'm normally on, in your places looking up. But I know that it can be a challenge to actively engage even in the best sermon. You're thinking about what you might eat for lunch or happened yesterday in the football games or what's going on. We, have, we, there, we live in a world full of distractions. And then in many times we come to church and there's announcements or there's prayers or there's action being done by other people. But when we sing and make music together, you have the ability to actively participate in what the church as a gathered body is doing together. Um, a well-known theologian and worship scholar who passed away several years ago wrote a book called Worship is a Verb. It is something we do. It's not something we merely attend. It is an active um, engagement with the Spirit's work. So throughout the Old and New Testaments, we find this imperative, sing to the Lord. We see it in the book of Psalms. We see it throughout the Scriptures, we see it in the, in the book of Revelation. We are called to sing and make music to the Lord. Why? Because this allows us to be engaged and not to just be merely passive observers or, in worst case, consumers. Secondly, singing connects our minds, our emotions, our spirit, and our body together in the praise of God. Singing engages the entire body. I think too often we have reduced faith to a matter of right thinking. 
Now hear me, it is absolutely critical that we believe what the Scriptures say. We should hold fast to the truth delivered to us, to the doctrine of the teaching of our faith. But it is not merely a mental exercise, uh, a less formal way of saying, I tell my my students this, we are not brains on sticks. We are more than just our intellect. We're created with emotions and our physical bodies and our volition and our will. And God has made us this way, and we are to offer ourselves up to Him. This is one of the greatest challenges our churches are facing today in a post-COVID world. For many congregations, we were separated for months watching online, and then it became an intellectual exercise, right? As a worship leader, uh, you know, we would record worship services and then watch them from home. Even my family, which is incredibly musical, we didn't sing much during the musical times. Granted, it was a little unusual watching ourselves doing it, but still, it was, it was not something in our living rooms. We weren't really actively singing the way we would in a congregation. So we, we are battling this idea now that it's just something we listen to. It's a podcast. It's a sermon we read. But we need to actively engage with that, with our minds and our emotions, our spirit, our body. Some songs inform our faith. That first song we sang, a wonderful expression of the Word of God that that communicates truth to our minds and to our spirits. Some songs stir up our emotions and our affections towards God. My sin, oh, the bliss of that glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. What a wonderful truth, but a truth that moves us and stirs our emotions and affections towards God. His goodness is running after me. That's an evocative language causing us to think. It's taken from Psalm 23, that God is ever seeking after those whom He loves. These should stir us to faith and stir us, stir our emotions. Now, some of us are not given to emotional expression. I'm not, okay? I, I'm, I'm affectionate, I'm friendly, I'm warm, but I am rather reserved, okay? For me, the best day is sitting in the, in, in the living room with a book and it raining outside and no one talking to me. That's my default, okay? And um, there's nothing wrong with me when I'm that way, that's just who I am. But I have learned that I have to express myself to the Lord. And sometimes it's joy, it's happiness, and it's sadness, and these emotions. And these are important, but we have to remember that emotions are dictated to us by our circumstances. Your happiness may be directly tied to how much caffeine you have in your body right now, or the temperature of the room that you're in right now, okay? Those things dictate our happiness. And as worship leaders, as musicians, we don't evaluate how well we're doing by how well the congregation's smiling, or or, do they look happy? I mean, we want you to enjoy what's going on, but that's not the goal. We are hoping to stir your affections and your love for God. And again, I I might describe it as the difference between happiness and joy. I'm happy when my sports team wins. I'm sad when they lose. Can I have joy when I receive the stage four cancer diagnosis? The scripture says, rejoice. Again, I say and rejoice in all circumstances. That's an affection towards the Lord, not an emotion. But the reality is that singing shapes all of those things. Singing is a type of um, emotional gym that we go to practice to learn behaviors. The book of Psalms is replete with different responses of David and the other Psalm writers to the Lord. They're shocking sometimes. We think we, we, we focus on Psalm 150 and we focus on the ones that, that are great to open up a worship service with. We don't read the ones, Lord, kick their teeth in. That's in the Bible, by the way. That's literal words from the Bible. David praying, kick in the teeth of my enemy. I don't know where we'd schedule that one for worship. I don't, would, <laughs> couldn't do that one. Um, we see sorrow and lament. At church, often we feel this pressure to just be happy all the time. And put up a wall and say, I'm fine, everything's fine. But the reality is, as a body of Christ, we are to to rejoice with each other, to mourn with each other, to grieve, to walk alongside with each other. And the music that we sing gives us a vocabulary to do that. 
Thirdly, congregational singing is the only thing we do at church that we're all doing the same thing together at the same time. Now, your congregation, you have three different bodies that meet together in different languages and those kinds of things. That is a wonderful testimony of God's faithfulness among your church. But you know that as you're worshiping here, the Mandarin congregation singing their praises too. And while you may not be in the same room, you're united together in the action of singing. That's a powerful, powerful tool. And I smiled, brother, when you said this morning, you almost lifted a sentence of my, my sermon verbatim. I have this written, corporate worship is not just a collection of individuals who happen to be worshiping God in the same room. That's true. It's not just us and God. It's us together worshiping God. He, when we sing, the entire church, with all of our differences, our preferences, we're, we're united together to proclaim the excellencies of Him who's called, about it, called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Fourth, music allows us to express our emotions and our affections in ways that few other activities can do. Music is a powerful tool We've all been in the movie theater before when the music starts to swell and our hero or whatever comes over the hill and we're ready to charge with them, right? Music has that powerful way of, of moving us. Or perhaps it's the, um, the Beethoven Ninth Symphony and we're at the last movement and the choir comes in and the soloists are singing, the orchestra's playing their hearts out and all the goosebumps on our, on our neck pop up and we're ready to go. Music has the ability to move us. And it's a responsibility that we're called to use well, not out of manipulation, but it's a gift of God. We're called to, we're, we're made to respond to music and it moves us. I think of um, in the Old Testament when Saul calls to David to play music to soothe his soul. This is a gift. We should embrace the use of that gift. Fifth, the songs of our faith shape our beliefs and practices as well as, if not better, than most sermons. Now, if I asked you, you could probably tell, tell me what Pastor Co. preached last week, maybe even a point or two, maybe the week before, probably not six weeks ago, right? Maybe, I don't, I, I've, I've heard Pastor Co. speak a few times, it's, he, he opens the word well. Um, the reality is we are not tuned to remember words that way. Now, play a song from when you were 17 years old and you haven't heard in 30 years and you will remember every lyric. We've all had that experience, right? Or, you know, try to recite the alphabet without singing the song. Like, it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. Singing somehow enables truth to embed in our minds in ways that just the spoken word doesn't. And it carries that text and lets it dwell deep within us. The, the reformer Martin Luther famously said, Music is a fair and lovely gift of God, which has often wakened and moved me to the joy of preaching. Next to theology, I give music the highest place and the greatest honor. My heart bubbles up and overflows in response to music, which has so often refreshed me and delivered me from dire plagues. It is so important that we give careful attention to the words that we sing as a congregation. Obviously, they need to be theologically accurate, but more than that, they have to live up to the message that they're carrying. The songs that we sing can communicate the transcendent things, the things about God that we don't have the words to express, the holiness of God, the majesty of God. Music enables us to conceive of the idea of majesty in ways that we can't otherwise. Music has the ability to express truth and reality. We can express the beauty and the sorrow found in the world and see how God's at work in both. And then music can communicate the hope of God's redemptive plan. Now, we didn't sing that last verse of it as well, but Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be made sight. That is the hope that all of us as believers share. And music drives that deep as an anchor to our soul. Sixth, music connects us with those who've gone before and reminds us that Christianity is bigger than we are. In 2022, we, are, we live in a world that is consumed with our preferences. We've all had that experience, right? 
you've looked on something on Google and then you go on social media and there's an ad for it. And that scares us. And we're like, how does that work? The reality is everything in our lives is, 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 is tailor-made to our personal preferences. And the church has to fight against that, right? We're called to set aside our preferences and to mutually submit to one another. That is not fun. None of us likes to do that. I don't like to do that at home. We don't like to do that at church, but the, we are called as believers to do that. And when we come and sing, maybe it's not your favorite song. Maybe it's your brother or sister's in Christ's favorite song. And we are showing love and deference to one another as we sing music that may or may not be what we like the best. We learn from each other when we sing music from other people that are different than us. We realize that Christianity is not just an American thing. It's a global thing. And, and you guys are, are, are aware of that in ways that I'm not. But we also remember that Christianity is 2,000 years old. We tend to be prisoners of the moment and forget that God has been at work just as much in the lives of the people in 1418 as He is today. And we need to have the humility to learn from those who've gone before us. Um, one of the oldest texts that's been sung by believers for centuries is a Latin hymn called the Tedeum. And it's literally been sung for well over a thousand years. And the text, I'm going to read the English translation, it's a formal language we don't, we wouldn't speak of, but I want you to hear some of the truth that's contained in this song. We praise Thee, O God, we acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. All the earth worships Thee, the Father everlasting. To Thee all the angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To Thee cherubim and seraphim continually cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of Your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise you. The godly fellowship of the prophets praise you. The noble army of the martyrs praise you. The holy church throughout all the world acknowledges you. The father of infinite majesty, your honorable, true, and holy son, also the Holy Spirit, the comforter. I was translating there a little bit on the fly there, but you get the point. For centuries, the church has been recognizing the fact that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And when we sing, we add their voice to the worship that is around the throne of heaven right now. And we're called to remember that music allows us to do that. And then lastly, singing and making music to the Lord celebrates God's creativity and our likeness with Him. It's an act of stewardship. In Genesis 1, we read the word where God says, let us make man in our own image. At the image of God, he created him. And male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed and that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for, for food. This uh, beautiful telling of the creation story um, ends with this, ends the series of the unfolding events of creation. We see God being this master artist, spinning the galaxies into orbit, causing the mountains to rise and the plants to bear fruit and the birds to fill the sky and the, the animals to fill the sea. And then at the last act of creation, he creates humanity in his image to be a reflection of his character and his actions and his nature. And every time we make music or we're creative or you sew or you paint or you draw or you just admire a beautiful sunset, your creativity, you are expressing something about God. And as a congregation, we should cultivate those gifts. So music is a powerful tool. And I commend your church for prioritizing it. Congregation, you don't need to be spectators watching the choir or the worship band sing a play. You need to take the role that God has given you as the church to sing and make music to the Lord for His praise and glory to each other for your good and your benefit. Um, the scripture ends, and as I conclude, we, we've seen this call of God to us to let the Word of Christ dwell richly within us. But the last verse of that passage, verse 17, says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. 
Let's do that now. Let's give thanks to God. Father, we give you glory now and forevermore in this congregation and throughout the world. Father, you are worthy of our praise. You are the one who has saved us. You are the one who has created us. In you, we live and move and have our being. Father, I give you thanks for this church. I thank you for, your, their, for their faithfulness to you, for their commitment to honoring you through song. Father, I pray that you will strengthen them and sustain them and let them thrive and flourish as they seek to do your will. And Father, as we sing your praises, let the word of Christ be on our mouths and our lips and in our hearts as we are teaching and admonishing one another as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness our hearts towards you for you are worthy. Father, thank you for this time in your word this morning. Thank you for meeting us here as we've gathered around your word. Now, Father, continue to be glorified in the remainder of the service.